Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. Also, a huge special thanks to our patrons over at Patreon. Our current patrons are John Donna, Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, and Max Lunig. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you would like to join them in supporting us and get a ton of fun perks such as patron-only commentaries or episodes a day early, just come on over to Patreon. There's a bunch of new things coming up, too, that Andrew's got prepared that is going to be really cool. If you go there right now and support us, you'll have available commentary for Cats that we did a while ago. And just brand new today, as of the day that this is posted, there will be a commentary on the 2003 adaptation of The Music Man starring Matthew Broderick. Oh, it's I'm sure it's fantastic. We actually haven't recorded it yet, but it's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> Andrew, do you want to talk about your our um, Amazon affiliate? My, <laughs> yeah. So, um, if you want to support us in other ways and don't have uh, money to spend on us specifically, uh, if you're going to buy anything on Amazon, you can use our Amazon affiliate link, and we will get a portion of that money for for free. Basically, you just give it to us, and it doesn't cost you anything else. So, there's no free reason money. not to use it. No reason not to yes. use that link if you want to support us. Um, I think that's in the description. At least it should be. It is in the description. All right, guys, let's get to the real show. Uh. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater more. How are you on this fine, fine, fine day? Well, you know how I am. I'm always interested in getting lots and lots of money <laughs> in any way possible. Like, I don't care how I get it. So I actually just got run out of town. Um, and you know what, Andrew? You know what day today is? Flag day. Happy Flag Day. Happy Flag Day. It's incredible that this is a holiday that literally everyone celebrates, right? You you have a festival and fair and fireworks every Flag Day, don't you? What's a flag? Oh, no. What is a flag? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what are we talking about this week? If I'm not mistaken, we're talking about the music man. <laughs> da 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 The Music Man is a musical with book, music, and lyrics by Meredith Wilson, with criminally uncredited material from his wife, Rini Wilson, based on a story by Wilson and Frank Lacey. The plot concerns a con man, Harold Hill, who poses as a boys' band organizer and leader, and sells band instruments and uniforms and instruction books to naive Midwestern folk, promising to train them as members of a new band. Harold is no musician, however, and plans to skip town without giving any music lessons. Librarian and piano teacher Marion sees right through him, but when Harold helps her younger brother overcome his lisp and social awkwardness, Marion begins to fall in love. Harold risks her beat. Harold risks being caught to win her, too. So, Andrew, what are your thoughts of the music? Well, this wasn't my first time watching it, but it was my first time watching it in a long time. But I've always liked this one because it has a lot of really fun music, and I love slimy salespeople so much. <laughs> and the whole thing is just about that. So, I mean, you can't go wrong. Can I, can I be, like, really brutally, like, transparent here? Yeah, go for it. This musical is basically my musical theater origin story. This is like the first musical like I was like properly obsessed I, with. You know, I doubt that you're the only one. I feel like everyone had this experience where they just watch it at their grandmother's house and not fully understand what's going on, but look forward to like the broad strokes of the like, oh, here's where the old ladies talk like chickens and oh, this is where the old men talk like a train and oh, this is where he gets the town all riled up. I like the guy with the anvil. In his suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> this is a strangely very slapsticky comedic show. You know what this show would be perfect to be combined with? The Muppets. <laughs> you think they should do a Muppet adaptation of the Music Man? Dude, the Muppets Music Man. It would be. It would just work really well. It would. 
<laughs> um, who would you get to play Harold Hill? I think that would be the celebrity guest, I think. I disagree. Um, I think it would be Kermit. <laughs> Either you're closing your eyes to a situation you do not wish to acknowledge, or you are not aware of the caliber of disaster indicated by the presence of pool table in your community. I don't, I feel like Kermit couldn't be that slimy. He's a frog, though. Fozzie could be that slimy. No, Fozzie would totally be Marcellus. That's true. That is true. He would sing the fuck out of Shapoopy. Let's be fair. Oh my goodness, I would watch that. <laughs> I'm telling you on this. <laughs> I I still don't know about Kermit, though. Uh, maybe like Gonzo or something like that could be. I, I'm sticking with Celebrity Guest. Celebrity Guest as uh, Harold. Seth MacFarlane. Oh, no. We've all heard him shink, sing the fucking songs from this because he does it all the fucking time. Yeah, he does. Shows. This was like his favorite musical growing up, too. But this is like one of very early musical Americana. Like when um, the orange one says, Make America Great Again, this is the version of America I believe he's referring to. You know, the golly gee, willikers, all that type of oh, Americana. Oh, what, what do they say? What do they say in this? Uh,. Uh, great honk. <laughs> <laughs> Ye gods. Ye gods. Great honk. Not okay. <laughs> and let's be completely fair, we are referring mostly to the 1960s movie starring Robert Preston, um, Shirley Jones, and Ronnie Howard. Which by all accounts is a fairly accurate adaptation. And one of my favorite film adaptations, because it is unabashedly unashamed of what it is. It knows exactly what it is and is very proud of it. And it uh, it follows the Fiddler on the Roof uh, adaptation with it being two and a half fucking hours long. <laughs> <laughs> with no intermission. Thank you, no Phil. No cuts, nothing. <laughs> Can we, like come to an agreement that movies that are over two hours long should have an intermission. I'm looking at you, Avengers Endgame, making me sit there for three fucking hours. Not okay. Not okay. <laughs> I mean, this also... Ooh, like, this musical strangely has aged well, and only because of very specific choices. Like, a lot of musicals from this time period... That are just strictly around the romance. You got the Julie Jordan's Billy Bigelow stories of the world, which really just kind of make you cringe. Oh, <laughs> Whereas yes. Whereas this one, they made the very smart choice of not making the romance strictly about like, ooh, he, he pushes me into a corner, breathes on my glasses, and makes me weak in the knees. It's strictly about like, this man came in and changed my family dynamic for the better and made my brother more confident and th where that cannot be a bad thing. And then you see the good side of him as opposed to the negative. It has a much more realistic feeling even than She Loves Me. While that is true, it is entirely based on lies and trying to scam people. <laughs> so there's like so, there's sort of like a, he did that stuff, but did he really mean to or was he just trying to scam people? <laughs> well, there's that line at the very end that I think really sets up his motivation um, throughout it all that I think. Yeah. It's a very subtle line that I think is really good where he he's like, kid, like, that's what I thought you were a great kid. That's why I want you to be a part of the band. There are two things you're entitled to know. One, you're a wonderful kid. I thought so from the first. That's why I wanted you in the band. So you stop moping around and feeling sorry for yourself. What band? Well, I always think there's a band, kid. Yeah, and there's that there's that one part where he sees a band, like a reflection of a band, and he, he pretends to actually conduct them. Someone who's that good with people cannot be nearly as sardonic as he likes to portray himself. Although, I'm wondering if he always thought there was a steam-powered car as well. Last I heard about you, you were in steam automobiles. I was. Well, what happened? Somebody actually invented one. No. <laughs> <laughs> this film has so many good jokes in it that I didn't get as a kid, as that every time I watch this, I find it even funnier. There's some there's some very good jokes, um, which is why this would be great with the Muppets. It's just fucking throw them in there. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the characters, like before we go even further, because this has some like really full thought out characters. Like in most musicals, c characters kind of in the for like the background, like only set up through song. Whereas this is very comedic, very a broad characters that feel effective. Um, yeah, let's start. Let's just go right into to Harold Hill. I want to hear your opinion him. before I go in. So I want to <laughs> hear what you think first. Harold Hill is a character that only works depending on performance. 
like say what you will about Matthew Broderick as an actor, but he is a terrible choice for Harold Hill. <laughs> he does not have a screen presence. But folks like Dick Van Dyke, like in the 1980s production, that works very well. And Robert Preston just is Harold Hill. He developed that role um, much in the very same way that Rex Harrison developed um, Henry Higgins. That is him. In fact, they were going to cast Cary Grant in the role. And basically, Cary Grant said, you're going to hire Robert Preston or I'm not even going to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so he embodies that role. And it is a spoken, rapid, like, basically, this this musical is the start of rap in musical theater. Um, not talking about, like, in the same way as, like, Hugh Jackman likes to interpret it as like actual rap, but more like spoken to a beat style singing. Um, and that is basically the way that they transform his musical style as a traveling salesman, as a spoken rhythmic idea. And it makes everything he says very clear and allows for a lot of clever phrasings and all that. But is he an all in out villain? What do you think, Andrew? Oh, absolutely not. He's what we He's like to call an anti-hero. <laughs> well, I, I think of him like these traveling salespeople type are not living high class, you know? He's somebody who needs money, and he needs it badly, and he's good with people. So he does what he, what he can. <laughs> He's not now, doing how do you it think in... He, and What's that? But Harold Hill isn't even really his name, even. His real name is Gregory, or even that's not even his real name. He changes his name depending on what city he's in. Yeah, they don't even give, like, his real name more than, like, twice, I don't think. <laughs> no, it's when he meets Buddy Hackett, and he's like, Gregory! He's like, no, that's not my name this time, it's Hill now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you consider him the villain. Because, honestly, the villain is the guy just trying to out him. <laughs> I mean, for most of the time, it, the villain was um, his love interest, Marion. Well, she was someone trying to out him, and then she right. stopped, and then somebody else showed up, and now he's trying to out <laughs> him. So basically, the whole show, you're trying to root for him to scam this entire town. <laughs> <laughs> and they work really hard to make you want to see that, because this town, they're full of basically a-holes. Yeah, they're stuck up and. Like, right when they first introduced them, they're like, oh, we're so nice, but we're rude also to everybody, so. <laughs> we're going to be rude to you, but we're really cool. Yeah, but, like, not really, though. <laughs> but the thing is, he doesn't take it personally. He's like, ah, something new. Like, I, that type of attitude is kind of what makes him so charming. <laughs> he doesn't it's take not... it personally because he doesn't want them to hate him. <laughs> he wants to scam them at everything. But you know he wouldn't take it personally even if he wasn't. He'd be like, ah, I wonder how I'm going to do this. These simple town folk. I feel like you don't even see his real character until, like, right near the end of the show. Do you think that every word he says is a lie? Yes. Really? Up until the very end. At the very end, like, once the whole mob scene starts happening, I think that's when the real... The real Gregory comes out. <laughs> And, like, when, when he finally goes to conduct the band in front of everybody and he, he has that moment like, oh, I can't, I can't even do that. It's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, if he was, if it was an earlier version of him, he would have just jumped right up there and been like, all right, here we go. <laughs> think, everybody, think. <laughs> but they do a very good job at making him look disheveled in that final scene. Like, he... Like, this man that once was able to get this entire town in a frenzy is a broken, beaten guy, all because he really wants to tap some piano player ass. He also isn't going to get his money anymore, so he's kind of sad about that, too. I mean, he already collected the money, so... Well, I don't think he's leaving the town with that money. <laughs> if he is, he's going to be tar and feathered and probably dead. Is Do you think the entire finale is a dream sequence, or do you think that actually happens? <laughs> Jacob Ladder style, <laughs> as he's being... have tar poured on him. Like, like, I mean, after the kids play, like, terribly, that whole ending, does that actually happen? Where, where they get the better suits and then they actually play well? That doesn't happen. 
I think that that's just like the fantasy fun sequence to end the show. At a certain point, it all wrapped up and everyone probably goes home and has an awkward conversation, but that's no way to end the musical. Yeah, they go home and they're like, so he didn't teach how to play that thing, did he? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think about that think system that he comes up with, though? Um, Deepak Chopra would be proud. That's basically like playing by ear, right? No. <laughs> I In think a he's, way. He's going for more of a... What was that, what was that self-help book that was really popular for a while? <laughs> you Pray Love? No, no, not that. The one where it's like, if you... If you, like, think about something a lot, it actually will happen. But his practical description of it, like, made sense to me. Like, if he had backed me in a corner the way that he did Marion and said it, like, it's like whistling. You don't you don't need music to whistle. You just kind of do it. Yeah, but a lot of people suck at whistling. <laughs> I'm just saying that's not an invalid way to look at things. I mean, the invalid part is that you can't think a note and then know how to play it on an instrument because you don't know how to actually make the note sound that you're thinking of. So what do you think about Marion as a character? I don't know. She's like a hard ass at the beginning and then very easily changes her mind about him. Her little brother sings one little one little section to a song and suddenly she's like, oh, never mind. He's This guy's totally fine. I don't care. In fact, I'm in love with him. <laughs> I have a theory about Marion. Since I grew up with this movie in my childhood... Like, it is very common for me and my family to make up our own, like, backstories of this, these sure. films. All right, so this was the backstory we crafted for Marion. So, you know, my, um, Madison, um, the, her Uncle Maddie, her yes. father's best friend. The one that, that they thought that she was with or something? She was banging. Yeah, which is weird. Well, I'm gonna say that she was banging him, and Winthrop oh, is boy. her child... Because look at her mom. Ain't no way that child is hers. She's like 70. I mean, I was kind of thinking that, but at the same time, come on, it's her uncle. You're going you're gonna to put that on her? I think it's like an uncle in the same way that, like, if I had a kid, you would be my kid's uncle. Like, it's Uncle Andrew. He's coming by. She even says that's her dad's best friend, not like her his brother. So that was always my opinion. Like, um, Madison got uh, her pregnant, and then they just all passed her off as the Winnipeau's son, and she's been a little damaged by it. That's why she couldn't find a man for a long time. I'm not feeling this one, Jess. This this theory, this fan fiction is a little bit off. I think. Why do? Where do you think it falls off? You're in a small they town. Think that they're having an affair. You're in a small town. Somebody actually gets pregnant and gives birth. You're not going to be able to pass it off as somebody else's kid. That happens all the time. You, you never watch, like, fucking Lifetime movies? The Lifetime movies aren't real. Lifetime movies are garbage. <laughs> Have you never watched a Tyler Perry movie? Tyler Perry movies are garbage. <laughs> I'm just saying that there ain't no way that Winthrop is that mom's son. She is too I'm going to disagree. Old. I'm going to disagree. Because there totally is a way, because things like that happen all the time in real life. But the things that I describe don't happen in real life? They There's do? Never underage girls having a child out of wedlock and then hiding it and then claiming it to be their sister or brother? They do, but I don't want to put that on Marion, because I, I don't feel... I'm not that cruel towards Marion, I don't know. Oh, you were probably very young. Everyone makes a mistake. No apologies, no excuses. Oh, boy. Uh, Jess, this is These not okay. These are lines from the musical. Jess, this is not okay. <laughs> I mean, yes, but I love Marion as a character. She does kind of stop being a character after the Wells Fargo Wagon song. She basically is like, oh, a man. But she's a librarian, so you can you can get over it. The one scene that I think really is important, and a lot of productions cut it out, is the scene where she stands up to Hill after the anvil salesman comes in. And he's like, you know, he's got like 45 different girls in every state. She like holds him to task about it. That's something that she definitely should hold him to task for, because like, she may not have known that he was just going around seducing the women too. Although, I would have inferred that, but just based on the way he acts and knowing that he does this th stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you want to talk about Marcellus? Uh, he doesn't have that much of a character, but we can talk about him. Andrew, are you the Marcellus to my Harold Hill? I would say, if anything, it's the other way around. That's fine with me, too. <laughs> 
I really like Marcellus. I think he's he jumps on to like lying to his entire town <laughs> very like he, quickly. He went straight and all it took to to get back on is like <laughs> Harold just shows up and is like, "Yep, can you help me out?" And he's like, "Oh, absolutely." <laughs> <laughs> He's got a wife, and we, she is a character. She's one of the ladies with that hangs out with the mayor's wife. Like, wait, really? That is Marcellus's wife. I didn't even know. She's the chubby one, blonde one that plays the piano. Like that played the piano for like, oh, the that, Grecian urn well, scene. Play plays the piano. She has Big the player. Pi- she has the player piano. She's the one doing it. Yeah. Yeah. She has the the thing, and she forgets to turn it off. And yeah. That's that's Marcellus's wife. So he openly like. Just, How do you even know that? Is that in the movie somewhere? He says, "I got a girl. She's a good girl, Ethel Toffelmeyer." And then when the pickle taco girls come, she's like, "And I'm Ethel Toffelmeyer." You have you actually have to get deep into the lore to understand this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you have to remember that he says his wife's name and then pick out the wife's name. Yes, um, I have seen this movie way too many times. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> I I can get that from you, yes. Yeah. Um, that's the, basically the only reason why I, up, why I wanted to bring up Marcellus. He also likes to say Shapoopy, which honestly is pretty fun to say. I'm not going to lie. That's, that scene baffles me a little bit. <laughs> it's just a fun dance number. Just don't think about it. I'm, no, I mean, why is he the one that they all look to to say, sing it? <laughs> like, they're like, oh, Harold plans all this. Because Marcellus can say Shapoopy the best. What is a Shapoopy? It's just a made-up word that... It's the girl who's hard to get. Is it like a, uh... Like a jellical? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Call back to an episode that's only available to You Patreon. know what, Jess? I think what we need to do is we need to create a problem on our community that is only solved through buying into our Patreon. What do you think? Either you guys are closing your eyes to a situation you do not wish to acknowledge... <laughs> Are you are not aware of the caliber of disaster of voting to support us on Patreon? Well, you got trouble, my friends. That's right, I said trouble right here in the internet. Sure, I'm a patron donor. Certainly mighty proud to say it. Always mighty proud to say it. I consider the money I have in my cash to be golden. Help me cultivate horse sense. Have a cool head and a keen mm. eye. Jess, he's going for it. It's just that I said it takes judgment, brains, and paternity to go on a- to donate to our Patreon. <laughs> I say that any boob to take it and throw their cash in the bank. Now I call that sloth the first way step in the road to the depths of day grenade. I say first, medicinal wine from a teaspoon, then donating to fucking Kickstarter, and the next thing you know, you're fun playing with the money in the pitchback suit and listening to some big out of town Jasper call about horse race gambling. Not a wholesome trotting race, no, but a race that is set down right on the horse. Like see some stuck up jockey by sitting on Dan Patch, make your blood boil. Well, I should say. Now, friends, let me tell you what you need. You got Jess one, two, three, right four, five, six dollars in your pocket. Dollars that make the difference <laughs> between a gentleman and a bum. That's a capital B that rhymes with T that stands for Patreon. Patreon. <laughs> God, I wish I was more able to do that on the fly. That would have been a really good one. <laughs> Is there any other characters that's even worth talking about? I want to talk about Winthrop only because in the movie he is played by the director of Solo, a Star Wars story. Really? Yeah, that's Ron Howard. The boy. Does he actually have that lisp? No. I thought that they just found a boy off the street that had a horrific lisp. No, he was just, he was really famous for Andy Griffith at the time, and this was his big Hollywood debut. He was kind of annoying. I'll be, I'll be real here. I mean, he confuses, like, speaking your lines with screaming your lines. Yeah, I think a lot of little kids do that, though. I don't think it's really that bad until he starts singing. <laughs> now, what about the mayor character, who is probably, like, the goofiest antagonist, and he's most, his mo- character trait is getting caught up in his own, like, words? Uh, I mean, he barely has a character other than that he gets easily fooled and then gets immediately convinced out of it like <laughs> he's like oh shoot i'm getting fooled again not uh, one poop out of you <laughs> but other than that i mean he's, he's got a he, that's basically his gag and it's kind of like mildly funny uh, i think the um the barbershop gag is way funnier though you like the barbershop gag i love the barbershop gag <laughs> All right, let's <laughs> talk about that you don't like it um i have varied opinions on it You'll never find those four men in a <laughs> away from each other ever again. <laughs> They've hated each other for 16 years. 
I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was pretty funny. Like every time they show up, really you're funny. like, he's just gonna make them sing another song, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't overuse it. They use it three times. Yep. And, and generally, the songs are are pretty decent barbershop songs, so I'm I'm okay with it. <clears throat> one of them is actually my favorite song in this entire show. Wait, so you show. don't like the barbershop gag, but one of them is your favorite song? I said I wasn't saying anything. I said I'm mixed on it. Oh, okay. So what don't you like about it? Um, honestly, I feel like uh, they're just kind of there as a niche thing. Like, it's one of the few things that really dates this musical. That's it. Like, just about timing thing, it just feels like, uh, that's a little bit of the time. But that's a very small gripe. Very, the barbershop very quartets are awesome and hilarious, and I'm okay. I'm okay with it. I just don't care. <laughs> and I also think their first song, Sincere, goes a little too long. I mean, that's an argument you could make, but, you know, let's, we'll just re-edit the movie. We can cut it down to, you know, two hours instead of two and a half. <laughs> Let's talk about Charlie for like two seconds. Charlie, you're an anvil salesman. He needs to really fucking stop saying girly girl. I fucking hated that. Girly girl. Bye, girly girl. Is that an invitation, girly girl? Sure could concentrate five minutes on you, girly girl. Girly girl. Girly girl. Oh, that's cringe. That's his character. Maybe that's like a of the times kind of thing, saying girly girl all the time, but... No, it's just diminishing her. See, Harold Hill never called her by those demeaning names or anything like that. He's better than Charlie. I, I get that, yes. We had to put someone in there that's a worse salesman than fucking Harold Hill so that he looks even better. But, I mean, he does have a pretty fucking strong right arm, uh, considering he can lift an anvil around at all times. Um, and saying girly girl is just cringy. To be honest, I, I, I don't know who who would ever say that to any other person in the whole world. An anvil salesman. Not something I've ever heard anyone say in real life, i got to be honest with you. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say great honk in real life either, so... Okay, well that's just a 50s thing, though. Well, this is kind of like 1910 times. The 50s pretending to be 1910. Ah, e gods. Those two couples, I think we talk about them too. So the great honk guy went from being like a huge troublemaker to immediately getting fixed by Harold, like in two seconds, pretty much. Yeah, you just gotta yeah, pair him up with a girl. This is the best way to break up a gang. Throw Yoko Ono in her. I don't think he would make that reference. That's basically his solution. I don't think he would make that reference, but it's fine for you to do it, Chess. I mean, that's kind of what his solution is, and it's like, you need to take her up for ice cream. You have to do it, son. But he sets her up with the mayor's daughter, which is not the best idea. Well, that doesn't really go anywhere. What are you talking about? He he yells at her and yeah. in public. That was about it. And that was, like, way later in the show, too. Yeah. Just as soon as you forgot that was the mayor's daughter. Yeah, it's like, oh shit, that oh, that's still a thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and then Marion catches him fingering her in the library. It's like, Tommy! Uh, <laughs> inappropriate books, Jess. Naughty books! Ball sack. <laughs> I was trying to figure out if that was an intentional joke where they're saying it sounds like they're saying ball sack. Or if that was not meant to be a joke, and that's just the name of an author, which I'm pretty sure it is. It is a name of an author, but it also sounds like ball sack. Ball sack. So sadly, Jess is sick for the rest of the episode, so it is just going to be one-on-one -on -one time, me and you. Um, but I am reading uh, this amazing commercial that we have written out. Check this out. Ready? <clears throat> Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It is that easy. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. Um, today, Jess actually wrote this out. He is recommending a book. Um... Broadway Nights, A Romp of Life, Love, and Musical Theater by Seth Rudetsky. And it's narrated by the author, so isn't that fantastic? Um, but just to remind you all, to just download your free audiobook. You just have to go to audibletrial.com slash 
musicals with cheese and again that is just audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese for your free audiobook the crackers and the pickles and the fly paper look what do you talk 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 what do you get it? what do you talk you can talk you can talk you can bigger you can talk you can bigger 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 you can talk you can talk you can talk 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 bigger 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 you can talk all you want but it's different than it was no it ain't no it ain't but you gotta know the territory why is the model t ford made the trouble made the people want to go want to get want to get want to get up and go seven eight 9, 10, 12, 14, 22, 23 miles to the county seat. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Rock Island is such a good opening number. Uh, what do you talk, Jess? What do you talk? What do you talk? What do you talk? Talk, talk. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how into it I am. It's okay. It sets up the world of these accountants, or accountants, these traveling salesmen, um, basically our main hero without even introducing him and how well regarded he is by these basically his contemporaries and all that poorly regarded you mean honestly i think it's just fun to like have like it's obvious Meredith wilson is having a blast with the idea of like i always thought that these traveling salesmen talked like a train so i just had them talk like a train and it's fun well when you sell to people you have to keep talking the second you let them talk they'll convince themselves out of whatever you're selling them so you just gotta keep talking and talking and talking and talking and don't let them think So it makes sense that they would talk like a train. And he pulls this trick again later in the musical with Pick a Little Talk a Little, where he's just like, these old biddies in their, like, their hats with feathers, they look like and sound like chickens. It's true. But I think that that song's kind of annoying. Whereas this one's not Well, this song's kind of annoying. Kind of annoying, too, but in a good way. Traveling Salesman is just such a fun thing, and there needs to be more more stuff about Traveling Salesman, because... Really, the adventures of traveling salesmen are endless. I also really love the ending where Harold Hill says, I never gave you a name and just runs off the train. <laughs> Good punchline, well delivered, and now we know exa- we have a, basically a marker to always know where he is, our main character, with that suitcase. It takes, it takes Charlie a long time to come back, though. Probably- had to psych himself up. All right, Charlie, you gotta get there. You gotta get there and give word. Gotta tell all those girly girls. <laughs> patch, make your blood boil. Well, I should say. <gasps> now, friends, let me tell you what I mean. You got one, two, three, four, five, six pockets on a table. Pockets that mark the difference between a gentleman and a bum with a capital B, and that rhymes with P, and that stands for pool. This is a good one. This is a very good one. This song is iconic, and it's iconic for a reason. This song is exactly what you'd want from anything about a traveling salesperson. It's just somebody hyping up the whole town. Just through sheer charisma and knowing, like, two things about the town. It's like, oh, there's a new pool table. And they're kind of dumb hicks. They set up the pool table, too, earlier on with the visuals as well, which is great. (laughs) I think that this song is almost innate in all American, at least, musical theater people. Like, I I know basically every word of the song, and most people I know in the musical theater world also know it. This song is ingrained in all of us, and I'm not sure exactly how we learn every single word, but we do. But it is the most... Well, you just listen to it a lot of times. Exactly, but even, like, I am the very model of the modern major general. I've listened to that a bunch of times, and I still don't know most of the words of that. Well, or this is a patter song where it feels like it builds and it tells a story and all that. You could change the words and legitimately go to someone's door and sell them with some, with this song. <laughs> <laughs> like if I actually went out and full on sang it? Yeah, I think that somebody would buy something from you if you went out and sang this song. Like the intro is just kind of like, it fades right into the dialogue. Like, do you own this place? Yeah. Well, either you're closing your eyes to a situation you do not wish to acknowledge or you are not aware of the caliber to set. Like how it just kind of flows in from like the natural conversation and then suddenly the orchestra hits. You're like, oh fuck, we're in a song. It's perfect. <laughs> this is maybe the best song in the show. There's a few arguments, I guess, but I would say this is close. I'd say this is the most iconic song in the show, at the very least. I, I mean, 76 Trombones, though. Yeah, but what's parodied more? Like, 76 Trombones is the song they're like, okay, that's a music band song. But You Got Trouble is the one that everyone just kind of knows. I mean, we'll have to count the number of parodies. How many You Got Trouble parodies do we have? <laughs> um, Simpsons. Uh, I would say The Simpsons is doing the 76 Trombones scene, though. I disagree 100%. 
What are you talking about? They're in a town hall meeting, and then he comes in and says, you need this thing. That's the 76 trombone scene. It's not him in the streets convincing them that there's a problem. Wikipedia says that he is singing a parody of this song, so... But the scene is incorrect. (laughs) I know it was parodied on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Conan O'Brien's parodied it. Um, It was on The Electric Company and all that, too. Monorail... Monorail. Monorail. Come on. Monorail. They're all chiming in and it's exactly like that. Come on. Yeah, I love the monorail song though. I think that <laughs> All American Prophet has a little bit of that as well from Book of Mormon. It's like they mixed up where in the show You Got Trouble actually is because they always set it where 76 Trombones is when they do the parody, but then they do the You Got Trouble but song. Darling, when a woman has a husband and you've got nine. Why should she take advice from you? Even if you can't quote Balzac and Shakespeare and all them other highfalutin Greeks. Mama, if you don't mind my saying so, you have a bad habit of changing every subject. No, I haven't changed a subject. I was talking about that stranger. What stranger? With a suitcase who may be your very last chance. Can we talk about the piano lesson song, like, really quickly? I'm sure. It's like two chords, right? And, and... Yeah. <laughs> I just find this song so ridiculous. Oh, I know. This is the one where they go, uh, so, do, la, re, uh, t, me, yeah. something like that. My my pitch is horrible, so pardon me, but. <laughs> yeah, basically where they're talking about, like, how Marion's too uptight and she needs to get herself a man. Yes. I love the opening to it where she's like, mama, a man with a suitcase followed me home. Oh, that's a good thing. Exactly. <laughs> Especially in the worried way that Shirley Jones delivers that line. I'm like, that that means something different nowadays. Was he like, um, was he kind of like a salesperson? They set up a lot of Marion's like story threads in here. The Madison Public Library is entrusted to me and like all that. And no one listens to my advice. And she's like, it's because you don't got a husband there. It's that and that she recommends dirty books to all the little kids. Well, they only think it's dirty because they think she's a hussy. Which you apparently also think she is. So Just because she had a ca- child out of wedlock does not make her a hussy. Uh, if it was 1910, you wouldn't be saying that. <laughs> but what a woman has a husband and you've got none. Why should she take advice from you? Even if you can ca- quote Balzac and Shakespeare and all those highfalutin Greeks. I love I love the phrasing of highfalutin Greeks. That is a fucking hilarious statement. Those those rootin' tootin' highfalutin Greeks, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's so fucking perfectly Midwestern. I find it weird that she calls the man with the suitcase her very last chance. This might be the last time a man might ever find you interesting, love. Well, I mean, the thing is, when you live in a small town... There's only, like, a certain amount of men to choose from and a certain amount of women to choose from. So when some new guy comes to town, that's your last chance. If you've already been rejected by everyone else. I mean, he could. she could always miss his Robinson, um, Tommy Zealus, too. Or could she just hop on a train and get the hell out of there. Abandon her brother? Her Absolutely. Her son? Absolutely. <laughs> While 110 cornets played the air, then I modestly took my place as the one and only bass, and I owned pod up and down the square. Good night, my someone, good night, my love. With 110 cornets right behind. Our star. Let's talk about Goodnight My Someone and 76 Trombones, because they are basically the same song. I mean, they combined them later in the show, yeah. I mean, like, even if you play the chords, Good night, my someone, good night, my love, 76 Trombones led the big parade. That's true, but there's many songs that share chord progressions. I mean, he, he wrote it to be the same melody. They, he openly admits this. Well, the song that Professor Hill uses to illustrate uh, such a uh, glittering parade stems from the same melody, by the way, that has just issued forth in the preceding scene from our music teacher. I uh, must admit I did that on purpose to... Oh, suggest that these two people have 
possibly more in common than meets the eye? Good night, my someone, good night, my love. Seventy-six trombones led the big parade. And they do this, too, with the song Sadder But Wiser Girl and My White Knight. Both of those songs are made to fit together as well. And he pulls it again with Light a Rose and Will I Ever Tell You. You got this song set up its chorus. You got this song set up its chorus. Squish them together. It's called good composition, Jess. Get it through your skull, okay? Um, I'm not <laughs> saying it's bad. I like it. It's just worth mentioning. I will say that these, even if these two songs have very similar melodies, they don't combine very well. <laughs> you don't think so? No, there are two different tempos. I don't think they combine very well. I like it when they switch it at the end, which is the best way to do it. And But they are two very different tempo songs. They just have the same melody. It's a lot like Evita when Oh, What a Circus and Don't Cry For Me Argentina have the same melody. They just put them next to each other. Like, even at the end when they actually do the combination of the two, they just put them next to each other, basically. They don't actually really combine them ever. No, <laughs> they don't combine well at all. And they know that <laughs> they're mostly <laughs> meant to imply a stricter connection between these two individuals and i find it strange that marion's is the first one i suppose but they had to give her some character what do you think of the song goodnight my someone as like an i want character song for marion well it makes sense it is kind of boring i i always skipped it when i was a kid but i think shirley jones sings it very well like i want i just want to hear 76 trombones because that song's like really fun <laughs> <laughs> so you like 76 trombones yeah i think it's a blast <laughs> i actually forced my entire music class to sing this um in front of the entire school because i was that kid you could have picked shapoopy and you picked 76 trombones clearly you weren't a family guy kid <laughs> <laughs> i remember losing my shit when i saw that family guy episode i'm like they did the whole song choreography and all what the thing is it's just stupid <laughs> like, there's not even a joke really the I, I was like, I was like, I remember that Family Guy skit. I wonder what that actually was because I've never really watched the episode. And like the whole skit is just they tell they tell Peter not to gloat, and then he just sings the song. And it's like if the joke is just he sings the song, and that's funny in and of itself, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's really all you got here. <laughs> um, but you like seventy six trombones. Absolutely. It shows that he's not an idiot either. Like, he's able to pull out good, like, references and all that. Like, he's got it memorized. He writes a script, man. Yeah, but he has to know this stuff. Like, I, he knows what bassoons are and timpani. He knows, like, five instruments in, like, five band leaders. And that's about all he's got. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's more than a, a complete idiot would know. Well, he's obviously not a complete idiot. At a certain point, why not just learn a little bit of sheet music if you're willing to learn this much? Do you understand how much work that is? Music theory? Yeah. That's a shit ton of work. He's making bank with zero work. He learned this fucking <laughs> script. Yeah, I mean, it's like a one-page script, and all he has to do is know how to dance really well, sing really well, and magically have an orchestra behind him. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, some basic, like, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Great job, Jess. Give him a chromatic scale and then leave. You did your job. That wasn't chromatic. That was major, Jess. <laughs> you wanted to talk about the dancing on the show. There's some awkward dancing throughout the whole show. What are you thinking specifically? Uh, this song specifically, I don't remember anything like super awkward in this song. I remember the really high knee kicks and like trying to do it as a kid and hurting myself because I was stupid. What I love about this song as far as choreography is Harold Hill doing his little like run thing where he like ducks and weaves. <laughs> I think that's great. And they do it at the very finale, too. <laughs> that, I think, is a ton of fun. Um, my, my favorite delivery in this is when Harold Hill is like, trumpeters that improvise a full octave higher than the score! <laughs> he gets all the kids involved, like... Uh, and I bet all those girls are like, oh boy, I want to join the band. And it's like, only a boy's band. A boy's band, do you hear me? Fuck the girls. <laughs> no girls. No girls allowed. Boy's band. The only affirmative she will file refers to marching down the aisle. No golden, glorious, gleaming, pristine goddess. No, sir, for no Diana do I play fawn. I can tell you that right now. 
I snarl, I hiss, how can ignorance be compared to bliss? I spark, I fizz, for the lady who knows what time it is. I cheer, I rave, for the virtue I'm too late to save. The sadder but wiser girl for me. All right, how about the sadder but wiser girl? I really like the song. It is the closest thing to an I Want song we have for Harold Hill the entire time. And obviously that's not what he ends up with in the end. Yeah. He's basically like, I kind of want a girl that's been around the block a few times. I don't want this girl that's going to be like, I, I, I don't know what sex is. He wants a girl that's fucked. Jesus Christ, Jess. <laughs> that's basically the message of the song, though, right? I mean, I, if you want to put it that way. Literally, a line is, I hope and I pray that Hester will win just one more A. Yeah. Do you get that reference? Jess... You took it too far, Jess. Do you get what that I reference? I don't get that reference. Okay, so the Scarlet Letter, and she fucking gets an A put on her because she fucked a guy. Ah. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So Harold's not into virgins. He wants someone who's DTF. Okay, let's move on to the next song. <laughs> oh, what can I do, my dear, to catch your ear? I love you madly, madly, madam librarian. Marion, heaven help us if the library caught on fire and the volunteer host brigade men had to whisper the news to Marion. Okay, this is the one I think had the most awkward dancing in the whole show. Oh, really? You don't like the foot dancing? Yeah, no, this is the worst dancing in the whole show, I think. Why? I'm curious. I mean... They're like dancing around reading books. They're like reading books and dancing. Like, what the fuck is happening here? It's, it's fun. so weird. No, it not. No, it's just weird. It's awkward. My favorite part is when he sexually assaults her by kissing her, and then she sm- tries to smack him. Well, he deserves it. <laughs> well, she misses and hits Tommy. He deserves it too. Uh, yeah, fingering, fingering Zanita in the library. Fucking, he deserves it just for saying good honk so Great many honk. times. <laughs> How did, did people really say that at some point? Okay. Can't prove that they did. Um, I don't really have much to actually say about the song here. I, I just wanted to mention that I hated the dancing. This song has no merit on the plot whatsoever. <laughs> it's kind of the... No, that's why I don't really have anything to say about it. I like it. I enjoy it while it's on, and I kind of... I like the dynamic between Harold and Marion in it, where she's just kind of frustrated. If this had better choreography for the dancing, I would enjoy it more. Oh, you want to see some bad choreography? Wait till we watch the Matthew Broderick version. That has probably the worst and most baffling choreography I've ever seen. Oh, no. (laughs) Okay, well, I'm going to hate this song even more in that show, then. You guys, you guys, you're going to want to have, you're going to want to donate to Patreon to get this. This is going to be some grade A stuff. Oh, my goodness. This is not even meant to be an advertisement, but, like... That show sounds like it's going to be hot garbage. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> now, a woman who kissed on the very first date is usually a hussy. And a woman who kissed on the second time out is anything but fussy. But a woman who wait till the third time around, head in the clouds, feet on the ground. She's a girl he's glad he's found. She's his shapoopy, 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 shapoopy. The girl is hard to get. Shapoopy, shapoopy, shapoopy. But you can't Let's talk about Shapoopy for like one sec. Okay. What do you want to say about Shapoopy? What the fuck is a Shapoopy? <laughs> like, honestly. I think Buddy Hackett has such a great energy in this song. Oh, no. This is this is exactly the dance number that the show needed. And this dance number is great. I agree. And it has like the Bubsy Berkeley above, above shot. <laughs> like, it's great. It's fantastic. The dancing in this song is stellar and this is the perfect (laughs) this is the perfect like we have no plot to tell you right now have some dancing in the musical it's actually moved to be the start of act two and it's it's really good it's a good place for it that makes sense as a that makes sense this this is really there's basically no plot relevance in the song if i remember correctly nope um literally it kind of takes you out of what's going on (laughs) Yeah, it's like there's stuff happening, and then Marcellus is just like, I guess I'm going to dance. It's dancing time. <laughs> Buddy Hackett is such a um, very good presence. He is not a singer. He is not a dancer. Um, the the choreographer famously tried to teach him bell kicks, and he just couldn't do it. So he just did this, whatever, that little neat tap thing. It's It works perfectly fine for me. You know, that's, when I see Marcellus up there, I don't expect fantastic dancing i just expect him to do whatever he's gonna do light a rope, so light a rope, so. Dream. Light a rope, so. 
Rose slash Will I Ever Tell You. This is my favorite song in the entire show. And literally, I have no reason for that. It has no plot bearing. It tells us all information we already know. Light of Rose is great, though. Um, I, Yeah, I think it's fucking great. <laughs> I think Will I Ever Tell You... Um, this is one of the very few things I think the 2003 film does really well. Kristen Chenoweth can sing the fuck out of all of these songs and like perfectly and just the mix of those two melodies like light a rose i'm home again rose and dream of now like it just feels so romantic so dreamy it works really well together yeah mm-hmm. and i like how they did it in the film where you got like the two separate vignettes kind of on the screen like it feels so classic, dreamy, and I just love, like, I'm in heaven when I listen to that song. I just feel so relaxed. Did these barbershop quartets exist before this, or did they write them specifically for this? The songs? Um, they were written especially for this. Because they sound just like, it sounds like a barbershop quartet that exists before, you know? Yeah, I mean, it does, but no, these, every song was written especially for this. They did a great job with it then. I, I I was pretty sure, like, Sincere, like, existed beforehand. I wasn't sure. I don't like Sincere nearly as much as Light of Rose, whereas Light of Rose just has this bouncy, like, romantic edge to it. Like, every both those two. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the fact that you have Marion's section to break it up also makes it a lot more palatable, in my opinion. There was love. Until there was you. I know people are going to say it's like horrible that I didn't bring up Gary, Indiana, but fuck that song. Ah, <laughs> uh, Gary, Indiana. There was no Gary, Indiana in Ought 6. <laughs> Literally. Ought 5. Google search it, Harold. Until um, there was you is such a good romantic song. It's really good. It shows the range of the lead actress playing Marion, like to her highest range. Um, I do only want to bring this up because of a fun anecdote about the composer. The Beatles did a cover of this song. Oh, the Beat Boys. Meredith Wilson got more royalties from that one cover than he did from both the Broadway show and the movie and anything having to do with the Music Man combined. Yeah, that's because musicals don't have that sort of Beatles appeal. Shut your whore mouth! Look, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go out there and say I don't like the Beatles at all. I think the Beatles suck. I remember once you, like, when we were, like, really young, you were like, they're just the Jonas Brothers of the 60s. It's fucking true, though. <laughs> I, I was really hoping you stood by that. <laughs> I'm standing by that. I, the Beatles are lame. <laughs> and this new movie coming out that's Yesterday. gonna pretend the Beatles is hot shit is gonna fucking suck. <laughs> Hey guys, if the, hey guys, put in the comments if you think we should do Across the Universe. What's that? Is that a Beatles musical? Oh god, fuck me. <laughs> I have a friend who literally, I have a friend who literally, if you bring up the Beatles, he says, they're one of the most underrated bands of all time. They're so great. Like, not even kidding, he'll say that, and I'm like, dude, no. <laughs> Does he sincerely believe that, or is that irony? No, he sincerely believes that. He thinks that they don't get enough credit. Fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like the Beatles, but that guy it's like dude they get so much credit you gotta be kidding me <laughs> is the beatles version of this song good i've never heard it it's exactly what you would expect it to be jonas brothers singing this it's, till there was you it's just, yeah basically it's like they sing it and it sounds fine <laughs> i like the monkeys more than the beatles just throwing it out well, there the monkeys have like <laughs> really good comedic timing and they're good performers and yeah jess gets it jess gets it <laughs> It's a fine love song. I don't have any strong opinions about it, to be honest. I don't really have any strong opinions about most of these songs, because really, most of them are just good, and some of them are great. And that's kind of the whole show, right? Am I wrong about it? I don't have any song that I, like, don't like. Except for maybe Pick a Little, Talk a Little. That one's kind of annoying. Yeah, but it's effective. Like, it's trying to be annoying. Characters are yes, annoying. Yes, but if you try to be annoying and you're successful, then I'm annoyed. 
<laughs> well, for the first time in my life, I got my foot caught in the door. There was love all around, but I never heard it singing. No, I never heard it at all. Till there was you. Andrew, what is your overall thoughts on The Music Man and your cheese rating? So The Music Man is a classic that has aged very well. And I would just fucking if you if you haven't seen this, then you're probably not watching this episode right now or listening to this episode right now. And if you um, are, go watch it. Literally get it on Amazon. Yeah, like what the fuck? Did you just listen to an hour and eight minutes of people talking about a musical that you haven't seen? <laughs> And I've done like, that before, though. Yeah, but at the same time, it's it's not like we're talking about fucking uh, hello again, uh, hello again, or or society, society, uh, or whatever the fuck that was called, <laughs> institute, corporation, institute. institute, institute. Guys, we live in an institute. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> No, but like seriously, if you haven't fucking seen this, what the hell is wrong with you? It's Go watch so this right fun. now. So hey, <laughs> don't watch the 2003 Matthew Broderick version, though. No, no. Watch the um, which one is this? 1960. 62. Uh, I think that's the definitive version, I would say. Yeah. And Hugh Jackman uh, is starring in a revival of this with Sutton Foster that I don't think is going to be very good. But I just don't think Hugh Jackman's a good choice for Harold Hill. I don't. Yeah, I don't see that at all. I feel like you'd want to you want to get a more comedic actor. Like Save Jewel, Seth like, kind of MacFarlane chew. would probably be a good choice, as much as I know. Yeah, he probably. The problem with Seth MacFarlane is he's a terrible leading man. Oh yeah, he. I think he could pull this off because he just needs to talk and like be confident, and he's good at that. It's when he has to like pl- yeah. play those smaller moments that he's not good. I feel like he would kind of ruin some of the ending moments. I mean, that's fair too. He doesn't know when to not be funny. Yeah. No, what? Mike Myers would be a good choice. Put Mike Myers in there. Mike Myers actually probably could do it. <laughs> Either you're closing your mind to a situation you do not wish to acknowledge. He's just going to do it all as the cat in the hat. Honestly speaking, the version I want to watch is the Muppets Music Man. I think that they would do it brilliantly, and that's that's it. <laughs> the humor is like... Dead on for Muppets. Well, Disney owns a Muppet, so come on, folks. Dude, the anvil in the suitcase is literally, that's like a gag from the Muppets, essentially. <laughs> yeah, give your overall thoughts. Who the we'll fuck do the doesn't cheese. like The Music Man? The Music Man is one of the best musicals ever. It, it is such an emotionally connected musical for me, and I love it. It is like a, such a summer show. It's a flag day show. It's a 4th of July show. Honestly, it is Americana in the best way, where it doesn't feel pandering. I love every frame of this movie. I enjoy it when I see, like, college and, like, student productions of it. It is such a charming musical. Highly recommended. Andrew, what is your cheese rating? American cheese. That's fair. That's a good choice. You really, you can't, you you can't say anything else, right? (laughs) Are you ready for mine? Yeah, sure, go for Mine it. Mine is extra sharp, pickening cheddar, cheddar, because pick a little, talk a little, pick a little, talk a little, chick, 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 a little, little, little more. <laughs> Jess has got a tongue yeah, twisted yeah, yeah, up yeah. in his mouth right now. <laughs> <laughs> Jess going <laughs> to... Nick! Nick! <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, honestly, you say Americana, but you're right. Nothing says America more than someone walking into a town full of hicks and scamming them. Like, that is Capitalism! (laughs) Speaking of capitalism, today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicals to cheese to browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicals to cheese. Thank you guys for listening. That was such a fun episode. I laughed quite a bit. I, you know, the this is a good musical. Um, and honestly, I know we've pitched it a lot and just sang an entire song about it. But really, though, 
check out our Patreon. We're we have the commentary out right now of whatever shit fucking Jess is making me watch, <laughs> and I'm sure it's garbage. It is. Also, the cats one got some positive reception as well. So apparently, the cats one is pretty good too. Um, if you want to see the entire show devolve into me making meowing noises. <laughs> <laughs> Also, please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter, at Cheesy Musicals. As Andrew mentioned, our Patreon is at Musicals with Cheese. And Scram also at Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page, every Friday, alongside every podcast, there will be a video posted to pr- just promote about it. Um, usually made by me, but I'm trying to get Andrew involved in them as well. I'll make some, guys. Don't worry about it. We're, we're coming in. Oh, I'll do my Boston accent for the whole thing. I'll do my Boston <laughs> accent. Um, shoot us an Bastin. email at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Jolene Casco created our title card. Follow her on Instagram at Jolene Casco. And she is fantastic, by the way. Yeah. She did the artwork for my band Thanks as well, which uh, keep an eye out for the album coming out very soon. I just listened to a demo <laughs> of the EP, and it's fucking good, guys. You're going to like it. Uh, I got I got a advertise it so <laughs> feel free um also uh, i'm shooting a short film a short opera film this summer um if that interests any of you guys let me know i'm sure it's going to be fantastic just like his short film about um what was that musical that you made a short film about oh orpheus and your <laughs> <laughs> go fuck yourself all right we'll see you next time on musicals with cheese uh.